I am a judoka. Now, if you don't know what that is, the term judoka is used to describe someone who practices the martial art of judo. And even though I've held a number of different roles and titles throughout my lifetime, I identify as a judoka because the life lessons I've learned in judo are responsible for everything good in my life and continue to guide my actions today. You see, as a child, I needed help. My mother, who is a wonderful person, has battled mental illness my entire life. Bipolar disorder, an illness as cruel as it is unpredictable. Growing up, bipolar disorder, or the illness, as I like to call it, dominated our lives. There was no space for me at all. So, over time, and without any sort of positive outlet, I began to build up feelings of anger and frustration. By the age of 10, I had so much rage built up inside of me that I physically wanted to break something. So one day when I was watching television and saw kids my own age practicing karate and breaking boards with their bare hands, I knew this was something I had to do. Fortunately, when I talked to my dad about it, he said there was a karate dojo located right across the street from his work. But when we went down to register, the head instructor said I had to be at least 16 years old before I could join karate. So he suggested that I try judo instead. Now, I was 10 years old at the time, so waiting six years to do something that I really wanted to do seemed like an eternity. So reluctantly, I decided to give judo a try. Lesson one, clear your mind. At first, judo seemed to be the exact opposite of what I wanted to be doing. For example, we would begin every practice with a ritual called mokso. This involved us kneeling down, closing our eyes, and taking several slow, deep breaths for what seemed like forever. Apparently, it was the intention of this practice for us to clear our minds and refocus our attention towards judo prior to the start of every session. Now, this was incredibly difficult for me at first. Plus, I thought it was totally ridiculous. Hey, but if this is what needed to happen before they were going to let me beat people up, then fine. Now, at first, I merely just tolerated this practice. But then one day, something happened that completely changed my perspective on it. I was sitting at home in my living room when suddenly, and for no rational or apparent reason, my mother came up to me and completely lost it on me. Which, if you're at all familiar with bipolar disorder, can be a pretty common occurrence. However, in past, when I'd been attacked by her illness, it would leave me feeling devastated and I'd retreat upstairs to my bedroom where I'd often spend the rest of the day up there alone in tears. But on this particular occasion, I remember getting up, going to my room, closing the door, kneeling down, closing my eyes, and taking several slow, deep breaths. I cleared my mind of my interaction with her and then decided to refocus on how I was gonna spend the rest of my day. Then I opened my eyes, got up, and went outside to play with my friends. And that was the moment where I truly understood the value of this practice. That by engaging in Mokso, I could not only clear my mind of any unpleasant experiences that I might have, but I could also then choose what I wanted to focus on. Now this was quite a revelation for me, because up to that point in my life, I'd been a total prisoner to my interactions with others. How they treated me determined whether or not it was going to be a good day or a bad day. But in that moment, I learned that by engaging in Mokso, I could control the way in which I would experience the world. Lesson two, go with the flow. OK, so maybe Mokso was not so bad, but I still wasn't sure about judo. Because the next thing I learned was completely contrary to the idea that I would one day turn my body into a lethal weapon. Believe it or not, I learned that the literal meaning of the word judo was, get this, the gentle way. I know, right? <laughs> that the basic principle of judo was not one of aggression, but one of flowing with things. Now, in Japanese, this is referred to as seiryoku zenyo, or maximum efficiency, minimum effort. That just as water flows effortlessly 
through or around obstacles, when it meets resistance in nature, when a judo throw is properly executed, that too feels effortless. Okay, sure. Needless to say, I was totally skeptical about this at first. But then I had that one moment, the moment that anyone who has ever fallen in love with judo has experienced. The very first time you successfully throw someone with a judo technique. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was practicing with my partner and then suddenly, and completely accidentally, I turned in at exactly the right moment. The next thing I knew, my partner was flying high over my head and crash landed down hard on their back beside me. It was awesome. <laughs> A joy like I'd never experienced before in my entire life. And it didn't require strength or force, and it felt like I'd done nothing to make it happen. Except move in exactly the right way, at exactly the right time. Seirio Kuzenyo, maximum efficiency, minimum effort. I now truly understood what this meant. I had no idea how to make it happen again, but that didn't matter because I was hooked now and determined to try and master this principle. My commitment to going with the flow began to help me at home too. I began to notice the difference between whether or not I was dealing with my mother or the illness and was able to respond accordingly. When the illness was there, I just stayed away. But when my mother was herself, we began spending time together. Through this, I got to experience her warmth, compassion, humor, and the wonderful mother and woman that she was. Without judo, I'm not sure that I ever would have been able to experience this gift. And for that, I will be eternally grateful. Lesson three, effort is accomplishment. Okay, so now I was totally committed to judo, but I still wasn't very good at it. In fact, for the first two and a half years of my judo career, I lost every single match in competition. Then, when I turned 13, I was offered the opportunity to play soccer for a pretty high-level team. But when I learned that making that team would mean I'd have to quit judo, I felt torn, so I went to talk to my coach about it. And even though that conversation took place over 30 years ago today, I can still see it vividly in my mind. I remember going up to her after practice and explaining my dilemma to her in great detail. She listened intently, and then at the end looked me straight in the eyes and said, I think that you should choose soccer because you have no natural ability in judo. <sighs> Ouch. Now, I feel like I need to say that she was not at all being cruel. She was actually thoughtfully commenting on what she'd observed for me up until that moment. Still, I was mad, and I wanted to prove her wrong. But a part of me wondered if maybe she was right. That was probably the part of me that had lost every single match up until that moment. Anyways, I left our conversation feeling even more confused than when I'd arrived. But as I was quietly exiting the dojo on that day, a poster with a picture of the founder of judo on it, Dr. Jigoro Kano, caught my eye. On it was a quote which read, with effort, there is always accomplishment. And I don't know, but something about those words in that moment resonated so deeply within me. It didn't matter whether or not I was winning or losing at judo. I was already accomplishing things just by trying. Inspired by those words, I decided that I was going to continue to try. And not just try, I was going to work hard, harder than anyone. And that was the moment when I chose judo. Or should I say, when judo chose me. Lesson four, always seek help. I awoke the next morning with a renewed hope in my ability to be successful at judo. In fact, I got up every morning early after that and did push-ups, sit-ups, and went running for five kilometers, no matter what the weather. I never missed a judo practice and sought out every opportunity I could to get extra help. And guess what? Slowly, gradually, I started winning matches in competition. At first, one match at a time, but then one competition at a time. 
I finished that season in the finals of the Canadian Championships for my age and weight category. All because I had been able to see the accomplishments in my efforts. Then, shortly after that, I received some incredible news. Women's judo had been named a demonstration sport at the 1988 Olympics in Seoul, Korea. As a result, several of the top Canadian female judoka were going to be training regularly at my judo club, and some were actually going to even move there. With their arrival, we began doing judo six days a week. These women were amazing. The 14-year-old version of myself idolized them and dreamt of one day being able to represent Canada on the world stage as they did. Plus, they all had these really cool nicknames, like Lizard, Blaze, Zip, and Andre the Giant. <laughs> and even though these women were much older than I was and much further along in their judo career, they immediately embraced me and accepted me as a part of their group. Well, <sighs> embraced me or started beating me up regularly and bossing me around, Either way, I was a part of it. Seriously, though, I could tell that these women really cared for me and appreciated how hard I was working. Because soon, I too had a nickname. They called me Rocky. I loved my new nickname. I immediately embraced it and felt empowered by it. Because for those of you who are familiar with the story of Rocky, it involves an unknown underdog who worked hard, harder than anyone, and when given the chance to shine, shocked the world with what they were able to accomplish. So for me, the nickname Rocky meant far more than just these women cared about me and accepted me. It meant that they believed in me. Their belief in me at a time when I did not yet fully believe in myself fueled my purpose to achieve my competitive dreams. And less than two years later, because of the hope, empowerment, love, and purpose that I received from these women on a daily basis, I made history, becoming Canada's youngest senior Canadian champion. Ironically, one of the first people to come up and congratulate me after my win was my coach, who just three years earlier suggested that I quit judo. <laughs> but this time, when she approached me, she looked me straight in the eyes and said, today, you have taught me. Any kid can win, and this will change the way that I work with athletes from now on. And it did. And that was the moment I learned, through her ability to make herself vulnerable to me in that moment, that teaching and coaching was not a one-way street. It was a collaborative partnership. And that even though you may know a whole lot about something, you never stop learning. And that sometimes, when we seek help, we end up inadvertently helping others in the most unlikely and unexpected of ways. Lesson five, contribute to society. Following the 1980 Olympics, we all decided to relocate to the new National Training Center in Montreal. There, I met my new coach, a Japanese guy who everyone respectfully referred to as sensei at all times. At first, I was afraid of sensei. But despite his serious exterior and incredibly hard training practices, I soon came to realize just how much this man cared about each and every one of us. The final principle of judo is to strive to perfect oneself and contribute to society. No one exemplified this principle more than sensei. Sensei received everyone with an open heart and an open mind, no matter where you came from or what your skill level was in judo. But his commitment and dedication to us went far beyond anything that happened on the mats. He and his partner, who we affectionately nicknamed Mrs. Sensei, would routinely have us over for dinner and to celebrate the holidays with them. They gave up the top level of their home to house judoka, who otherwise would not have had a place to live. And when I was personally struggling financially, Sensei got me a job. And when he saw that my working was interfering with my ability to perform at judo, he helped to secure me a full corporate sponsorship in Japan. It was through his example that I found my true purpose in life. I wanted to teach, inspire, and help others. 
I wanted to be like Sensei. So many years later, after retiring from competitive judo, I began a lifelong career in public education and, of course, began coaching judo in my spare time. And just like my wonderful sensei and my teammates did for me all those years ago, I have always tried to lead with compassion and instill feelings of hope, empowerment, love, and purpose in everyone I meet. Embrace the gentle way. So now, many years later, as I contemplate the future of learning, I can't help but reflect on these lessons learned in past. Because the lessons I've learned in judo are timeless and would benefit anyone. I believe that by actively teaching our children how to clear their minds, refocus their attention, go with the flow, and see the accomplishments in their efforts, we are providing them with the essential skills needed to navigate our complex and ever-changing world. That by gravitating toward the things or people that fill us with feelings of hope, empowerment, love, and purpose, we are laying the foundation for inner peace. And that educating others to lead with compassion and contribute to society through our own example is crucial to the survival of our planet. For me, this is the future of learning. Because the final lesson I've learned from judo is that by embracing the gentle way, we can all help to make the world a better place. Thank you. <laughs>